What if uh, your neighbor's uh, kid started to see what... Then so be it. Right? Right? You were cool about it. I was cool with it. I mean, again, I wasn't chasing dollars. I was not trying to become famous. I was not trying to take over the world. I really just wanted to make a great product and share it with the world. And again, if it was one bottle or one million bottles, to me, there was no difference. It was just doing something great. Welcome to this classic episode of Spartan Up. Fitness, life, and work all influence each other. Today, we revisit two leaders who think about taking the long view and breaking from the pack. Peter Jackson, CEO of Bluescape, and GT Dave, founder and CEO of GT's Kombucha. Take note how both of them are using lessons from health and business to influence life and vice versa. And what, from their stories, can you apply to your own challenges? This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Honey Stinger and Climber Honey Stinger. Made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Use the code HSSPARTAN2020 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30% off. Climber, the most effective cardio and strength machine. Climber provides a full body strength and cardio workout with zero impact in only 30 minutes. Go to Climber.com, that's C-L-M-B-R.com, and use the code SPARTAN. Peter Jackson's mother taught at a school for the deaf and the blind. Her take on the world had a powerful impact on his thinking. Johnny Waite is introducing Joe DeSena's interview with Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson, um, powerful business person, powerful parent, and he talks a lot about perseverance, how to hang in there, how to be the long odds person that achieves success where so many people can't. Well, one of the things that takeaways for me early on in life was learning how to really read people, whether they're listening to that's me. How, that's or, what I was going to say, right? Because you're missing a few senses. Your mom really knows how to communicate at that level, so she's probably imparting that on you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, which is such an important part of, of navigating life. Listening, communicating, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's humor and communication, but uh, I, I kind of use text as my thing and when you think about business and, and my road has led me to a couple IPOs. I've got plenty of disasters I could talk about, you know, so sure. I don't want to act like I've uh, just been a rocket ship. Uh, I learned more during the disaster times, especially sure. on the ones that succeeded. But text for me is, uh, is really, you know, three things. It's, um, it's timing or tenacity. Um, it's execution within that and yeah. then getting out. What, what is the exit time for you? And that may not be apropos. You wanna say, I'm gonna do Sparta for the rest of my life. Sure. But when you're in the software business, uh, there's a path to an exit and most aren't IPOs. You wanna probably get part of a larger organization. And so what, what would you say um, were the secrets to, sec- well, tell us about the secrets to failure. What could we learn from your failures that um, could help us avoid those potholes? Well, I mean, you can identify with this or anybody who's you know, sort of watching the show in the sense that you can get really passionate about something, let's say five in the morning, and you're gonna go, you're gonna go do it, right? I'm gonna go raise money for mom and dad and some venture people or whatever, and you're gonna go, but there's things you gotta know. Is there really a market? Is there, if you're doing something no one's ever done before, uh, let's say it's MySpace or it's Friendster, the, the market really wasn't there. It was, it was cute, uh, but the market wasn't there because it wasn't mobile. Right? And you can think of a lot of those things. And why did Napster fail? Well, because music artists didn't want free stuff going on it. So the timing of going to market is important. On your personal life, if you're out of shape and you, uh, you're having twins, it's probably not a good time to venture out and try something where there isn't a market. So if you're establishing a new market, not good. If you see a market emerging, you can actually get the research on that. You can go, go out and find out that there's a market for it. You knew there was a market for this blog technology and you figured it out and that's why you have such demand. You saw other people doing it, you said, hey, I can take a different venue on it and you made a success of it. If you go look at a market and you can't find anybody else doing it or nothing that's going in that direction, you're taking a lot of risk, sure. both on the idea and don't do it when you've got personal things at stake. Sure, what, what, what's the trick from, you know, we're, we're bumping up against a growth phase where yeah. like the wheels are shaking a bit and you know, we've got, uh, call it, I don't know, a couple hundred employees around the globe and, um, to take that next leap to become a billion dollar brand, it feels like I might as well be trying to go to Mars, right? It's it, like, what's the trick there to breaking through? I think the trick is, it's, it's really hard to do it organically. And it's not even easy if I say, hey, here's a hundred million dollars, go do it. Although right. most entrepreneurs would say, all I need is a hundred million dollars and I can do it. Um, most of those guys get that hundred million and they still don't do it. Sure. But finding the partnership and the leverage, you know, in, the, in your particular space, I'm not good at it but it would be, hey, I got myself on this incredible network and right. the network became a strategic investor or, or something where you gave up some piece of your equity right. because they let you scale and go. And it isn't necessarily as much about money, but your production was able to get into a larger markets 
Got it. So if you're in the drink business, for example, you get in with a distributor, you're saying? Correct. Or, or, well, uh, you know, that's a really good question because um, in the drink business, which is really changing, people aren't drinking Coke anymore. You know, yeah. they're looking for organic chia seed, things like Apre, sure. uh, which is being born out of San Francisco. They get up to a certain point and then now the Coca-Cola's and the Pepsi's of the world are going, we got to get onto that trick. And sure. so you get to a certain point, you find them to be your distributor and they become your acquirer. So yeah. that's, a, that's a good example of timing, getting yourself to the point where you've got demand. You, women don't want to drink muscle milk. Right. They'd really rather have a prey. Right. And then they start drinking that drink. It changes the way they perform. Then all of a sudden it gets in the main market and then they sell out. Sure. So you feel like you're failing a lot of, I think most of the time, yeah. you know, until it gets into that, uh, that viral space where it's going and then everybody says you're a genius. When you're down here and you're struggling along, uh, there's there's a lot of headwind at you. Your family, um, uh, your friends are doubting you. Uh, your visa bill is getting bigger. Um, and so when you have those headwinds is when you have to really second guess where you're at and try not to become weaker. And you need mentors. Uh, you know, when you're going through that and every one of these startups I've done, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have an incredible uh, mentor network of other CEOs that have you know, the one I'm in now is seven of the 12 are billionaires. And they've done this uh, and talk about their pain stories. I wanted to just throw out really quickly, like long odd things or what guys like you and I do or the people that are watching or, or thinking, you can do long odd things. Um, things just, that are extremely difficult and it's a long shot. Yeah, and you just don't go, you're all fired up when you get that first business right. card or your right. website or something. You can get there, but there's gotta be something radical about you internally that's gonna get there. And it is working out, it's mental toughness, whether you're, you know, you're trying to get through boot camp and the Marines, um, you know, we're at Dodger Stadium. My my oldest son had his first major league hit here. Okay, yeah. um, that was an amazing thing for me because I told him when he was a little boy, "You're going to be a big leaguer." I mean, that's just kind of a rat right. to do to a kid. That's a long shot, you right. know. And so right. the kid just kept saying, "My dad says I'm going to be a big leaguer," and, right. and I remember all the family was clustered to see him after the game, and he texted me and said, "Meet me at 4A or whatever." I said, "Well, we're all over here." He goes, "No, I need to talk to him." He goes. You're off the hook, dude. You know, and I right. and uh, so that you know, and my other right. son is about to break through in the bigs. Those are long odd things you do to your children. It isn't because they were like I knew they could hit the ball, right. but when you're going out as an entrepreneur, you have to think like you're making the majors, right. and your odds are like one percent. And you're going to have to work out harder. Yeah. You're going to have to get up two hours early than everybody else, and you're going to have to come home an hour and a half later than everybody else. It, it's hard. You know it. I know it. What differentiates the person that breaks through that low point? versus the one that just succumbs and gives in and quits. I think when you're in that... Um, we all hit that low point. Well, you hit the low point, you're pretty lonely, right? right? Like when you're just starting, people do avoid you at the party because you're just talking, you're, ah, we're doing this and right. it's going to be huge. And you get to the point where there's like, people just don't want to hear it from you. Your spouse doesn't even want to hear it, right? Because yeah. you're not paying the bills. Right. So you have a lot of lonely time. And, you know, I imagine it's like the movie 100 you know, whatever, 72 hours, 27 hours, or whatever. And he yeah. finally just cuts his arm off, right? right? I mean, you get to a point where you come up with unbelievable ideas and you have all kinds of strength because you're that person you describe. Right. You're at rock bottom. Right. You're 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 this close to BK, or you're you gotta go work for your brother because yeah. you just can't do it. And you are thinking, you you know, if there were more hours than 24 hours in a day, you're using them and you find a path. You find a hole that you're able to crawl through. Or, or you pack it up. Or you pack it up. But, and, you know, and, but you, most people pack it up. I think a lot of people pack it up before they get to that moment. Yeah. Because, because he could have not cut his arm off, right? He could have just died there. You're not deaf and blind. You right. know, I've got a lot of tools. Well, that's, what I, that, that's the reason I bring it up is I'm convinced the, the differentiator between the people that quit and the ones that continue is their frame of reference. What's frame of reference, right? It's the values, beliefs, experiences you have in your life the glasses you wear and, and a, an Eastern European or a deaf and blind, like they had it pretty tough. And they're like, we can't make payroll. I, I ate cockroaches. Yeah, like, like, I can't make payroll, no big deal. <laughs> I didn't come from money at all. You yeah. know, I didn't come, I came from- No, but, a, but, but a your, mo thing. your mom uh, teaching the deaf and blind was probably changed your frame of reference during those early years. She had to work. Right. You know, she had to go to school at but night. But seeing those kids too and-, and like, Seeing them more than you, anything. You can't complain about anything. And they were smiling. Right. They didn't right. know any better, right? right? So, yeah. you know, whatever you come from, it, it, and your success is not that, you know, you go get a private jet or I get a private jet. 
it's probably you get more out of how you change other people's lives uh, so that they can experience things outside of work. Yes. You know, that they can yeah. be outdoors and they can go hike and they can do things like that. And I think that to me ultimately is success. The more money I make doesn't make me the more happy. Sure. The more I change people's lives, it brings tears to my eyes. Yeah, because yeah. it's not about the money, right? It's just, we just want to change life. We want to measure profitability and lives change. That's, you know what, and that's yeah. what's going to stop people from doing opits. And yeah. if, if that's what you're screaming about yeah. around the world, people taking drugs because they're trying to get out of their pain. They're trying to get something out of their way. And we need to change the way people approach their lives, the way they take chemicals, all that stuff. I just visualized a t-shirt, do, do burpees, not drugs. I love, I love it. Here's what our original Spartan Up team, Joe DeSena, Colonel Nye, Johnny Waite, and Suffer the Seed Huntress, took away from that interview with Peter Jackson. He talked about long odds, right? Yeah. And he, the chance of your child, especially when he's small, five, six, eight, ten, even, that you're noticing that he has potential to make it to the major leagues is minuscule, right? So he knows that. But go ahead and tell your son you're going to make it. That, that's an either uh, that can cut both ways, right? Mm -hmm. That can be that you're giving the kid positivity, that you're that you're raising him up, or you're or you're setting expectations in a bar way too high, right? Yeah, I was I was saying that as well when I was listening. And um, it's not to say don't encourage them, don't um, put that expectation out there because I think without that belief. There's zero chance. Like if, if you're told you're never going to make it, you're not going to make it. But I think the important piece is that, you know, there are a lot of parents who tell their kid, you're going to make it, you're going to make it, fill in full belief, and maybe the physical just isn't there and they don't get there. So I think it's important to do because it's going to create the possibility of it. But it's also important that that doesn't become the only metric by which they measure their success. You know, his other son, like he says, is, uh, is about to break into the majors. He's in the minors. What if he blows out his knee next month? knock on wood, I don't want to jinx anybody. And your whole you, life you've uh, spent. You were that guy who right. didn't get there, right? So, yeah, had, so who cares? Heat. But that how whole does, journey there is going to be an epic Peyton journey. Eli Manning's brother. Well, sure, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I said this on another podcast, right? But abracadabra means I create as I speak, right? Yeah. So you might as well, uh, we all create our own stories as we walk well, on this earth. Well, and it's what, like, what, what walk happens, to the great... So, so, so you speak and you create what you want to do and it doesn't happen. What happens then? Great. Well, then you've had an epic journey on the way thinking that you are going to make it in the people you meet exa and the where you exactly go. So you're saying. having a party. We're saying the same thing, which is that Just go out there, set that goal, go after it, but understand that it's not only if you achieve that goal that you're successful. Enjoy the journey. The journey Enjoy who is you the become thing, along right. the way. Yes. That's it. all I was saying is if you say to your son, if you don't go to the major leagues, I'm disowning you. That's yeah. very different than saying you're someone who could go to the major leagues. You could honestly do it. I believe you're the one in a thousand kid who could do it. Just like you're the one in a thousand kid who could do anything. Yeah. To your point, in the military, you know, you lots of plans. You write plans all the time. You got plans for everything, right? And so when you go into battle, it's a plan. But, but the mindset or the phrase is it's not the plan. It's the planning. Yeah, right? sure. It's it's because the planning is the training. The planning is your mindset, right. getting you ready and ready and ready. So when something happens to that plan, you're ready to fall back into another planning process. Sure. You know you're not stumped. So and that's what he said, right? One of the best things that he said was people always, and we've heard this from multiple people. People are always going to call you crazy and you're a lunatic, right? Until your thing becomes viral and then you're touted as a genius, and yeah. then all of a sudden all your hard work. I mean, you know, not everyone always thinks that every idea that. Maybe any of us have our good ideas, but if you, you were pointing stick at me with when you it, said that. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> any we of don't us. Use don't names. <laughs> you no, know, it's like Richard Branson. You know, he no, said yeah, yeah, yeah. there was some girl who was like, "It's all about luck and destiny." He goes, "Actually, it has nothing to do with luck and destiny. You make your own. You make your own destiny. You you go for it." Sure, hundred percent. But the way you do it, um, Stephen Leacock, a few people have been credited with this, but I'm a great believer in luck, and I find the harder I work, the more of it I have. Right. But, right? right. So so right. yes, Larry, you Larry might Bird try. Said the same thing. Yeah, you might try twenty things, and it's that one that succeeds. But you're out there trying. Lord knows I have. Which, no. which, 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 is, which is hitting the point uh, that, he, that, that he brought up, which was long odds, right? Go 100%. for the long odds. Go for the long odds. Yeah, yep. yeah. Next up, GT Dave, introduced by Johnny, Sephra, Colonel Nye, and a guest host, Death Race alum, Mark Webb. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Honey Stinger and Climber. Climber is a vertical climbing, full body workout that combines high intensity cardio with resistance training. It's one of the most efficient workouts on the market. With zero impact, the machine is safe for almost any age or level of ability. It's the first vertical climber to feature a large format touch display with on-demand instructor-led classes. Climber's patent-pending design has a high-quality build and a low level of required maintenance. It's easy to move, making it perfect for commercial or at-home use. The open design allows the user, you, to maintain correct body position without having to be inches away from the monitor. Climber just might be the better home workout you're looking for. 
Climber provides a full body strength and cardio workout with zero impact in only 30 minutes. Go to climber.com, that's C-L-M-B-R.com, and use the code SPARTAN to save $250. Honey Stinger is made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Honey Stinger's waffles, energy chews, gels, and bars give you the fuel you need to push harder, go further, do all the things that we do as Spartans. For training and racing, you need convenient nutrition that tastes great and works. Honey Stinger is Spartan's official on-course nutrition. It's made with real honey. Honey Stinger started with a simple plan. Wholesome ingredients, great taste, and, of course, honey. Why does Honey Stinger use honey? Using an ingredient engineered by nature, not in a laboratory, it has its benefits. In fact, the less you mess with Mother Nature, the better. That's why they're committed to the True Source Honey Pledge. And they've got a special code just for our audience. You can save 30% with the code HSSPARTAN2020. That's HSSPARTAN2020 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30% off, just for our Spartan Up podcast listeners. Joe just finds such fascinating people. And GT Dave is, um, is just a fascinating guy. Like He's very different than most people we've interviewed. And so, you know, if, you, if you've found that you think we're ever getting into like a pattern, a guy like GT Dave comes along and blows the whole pattern up. So watch this. It's pretty, pretty I, well. I actually kind of disagree a little bit. I see some of the same patterns in there. So he has a completely different personality and he's not you know, an endurance guy, but he's still part of the whole health and fitness movement. Yeah. And I see some patterns in there too. So Cool. Well, let's let everyone else go see it, too. Yeah. All right, so your parents say go for it. You're, you got your GED at this point? Yes. You got your GED. You're about to go into college? Yes. Santa Monica City College. Santa Monica City College. And, and what happened? Did you start taking stuff out of a batch and pouring it into a plastic bottle and peddling it? or what? Uh, Kind of. So what happened was that I started to make kombucha because up to that point my father had been making it. And he had been making it slightly differently where he was fermenting it longer than I think was necessary, so it was almost like pure vinegar, and it was borderline undrinkable. So I thought, well, how can I achieve the same potency but also make it much more palatable? So I started to play with my own batches, and I feel I achieved something that was more palatable, and that's what I started to drink myself. You were like, you guys don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I exactly. Got, I got it figured out here. Yeah, so I'm making this gasoline. Let's yeah. make something that good, tastes good. Um, and you, and did, just by playing around in the kitchen? Yes. Nice. And um, so I started making it myself, started bottling it, but I really approached, when things really came together is when I approached my first health food store. And the name of the store is called Air One. It's here in Los Angeles. It's the health food store that my parents took me to many years as a kid. 1996-ish? 95. 95? Yeah. And, and mind you, I'm making everything from my parents' kitchen. Right. Um, and I had designed the label on my computer, and it was really very much my own kind of artistic expression. Sure. Um, So I went to Air One, kind of pitched it, and really expecting them to, like, number crunch with me or negotiate, and they honestly just said, sure, when can you start delivering? How old are you at this point? I was 16. 16, I love it, love it. Yeah. So I actually showed up with my dad, fully dressed in a suit, with, like, a briefcase that had, like, a notepad, a pen, and a calculator that that I never opened up. Because I walked in, I just showed them the product. They said, sure. And then I said, okay. And then I left. <laughs> and that <laughs> so was it. Was that simple, you yeah. left the briefcase behind. <laughs> yeah, you didn't need that. Exactly. So, so you start, it starts working. You start selling. Yeah. But I mean, honestly. Do you, do you have a company set up at this point? Or, or? Uh, yes. Yeah. So my father, and this is you know, something I'm very grateful for. So my father is an attorney. And so he helped form Got the it. corporation and do right. some of that legal stuff to make sure that I didn't get myself into trouble. Sure. So he formed the corporation. And that's what I was doing business under. Nice. And, and, um, and so from there, it starts to grow. Yes. And before you know it, you're in the thick of it. Yes. Run into cash flow problems, labor problems. I mean, all the typical business. Well, so for the first two years, I mean, I was literally a one-man show. So I was making it, bottling it, delivering it, labeling it, it yeah. everything, right? And I was making it from my parents' kitchen, so I didn't really have an overhead. So I didn't have to experience some of the financial pressures that most startups encounter. So I'm very grateful for that because, again, I was able to just focus on innovating and expressing what I loved. Um, It wasn't until year three where I moved out of my parents' house. Well, the business moved out of the parents' house, and that's when I had um, my first experience with overhead, rent. I started hiring my first employees, and it, it was a shell shock. 
because not only was there the financial dynamics that I wasn't used to, but there was also the um, dynamics of working with others, right? Having somebody else make the kombucha. They have might somebody not show up one day. Exactly. Or they might just not have the, might, the right vibe. Right. Because I'm a firm believer that in energy and what you um, get is what you give. And if I just had somebody that came in and really kind of half-assed it, the product might be inferior. So I was very conscientious about that. Yeah, I, um, I'm listening to this story and it sounds a lot like mine. I, mean, I started at a young age in my family's house and then eventually got away from it. And it, it is a shell shock when you have to pay rent and become a big boy, yeah. right? And deal with that stuff. Absolutely. And so um, where does it where does it really, because now it's everywhere, right? I'm in the middle of Vermont and there's GT Dave's Kombucha, right? In the middle of, from Millennium Products. Yeah. How, when did it explode? Um, I mean, I would say probably the first... 10 years was just slow. 96 to 2006. Yeah, 95 to 2005. Slow grind. Slow grind. And a lot of it was intentional, the slow growth, because I treated my company and my product kind of like an overprotective parent. I didn't want it to grow up too fast. I didn't want it to kind of dive into the world and be influenced by all the corruption that I feel sometimes can be out there. So for the first 10 years, it was just slow, baby steps. But what if competition showed up? What if uh, your neighbor's uh, kid started to see what... Then so be it. Right. right. You were cool about I, it. I was cool with it. I mean, again, I wasn't chasing dollars. I was not trying to become famous. I was not trying to take over the world. I really just wanted to make a great product and share it with the world. And again, if it was one bottle or one million bottles, to me, there was no difference. It was just doing something great. That's great. And a lot of businesses don't have that philosophy. W- would you say that at the core, that's the reason you've been so successful? I, I mean, I would say it's one of the reasons why I think we haven't made too many mistakes or missteps. Is it because we haven't um, been exposed to some of that external pressure that comes from investors, competition, just a lot of that external noise that says you need to be this, you need to be that, you need to be here, you need to be there. It just allowed me to focus on the um, kind of artistic journey, which I think ultimately resonates with the consumer because I think most consumers really appreciate when something comes from a pure place. Yeah. And um, Yeah, no, I didn't even know you, and I know the product, and it, you just feel it. Yeah. The label, like the bottle, the drink, everything feels authentic. Yeah. Like, like whoever's making this cares about it. Right. right. And that's absolutely positively intentional, of course, and sacred. I mean, whenever we do anything, whether that's a new flavor, a label change, a website change, we don't look at, like, what's trending, what are, people, what are other people doing, what should we be doing. It's really about um, how can we communicate in a voice and a tone that will resonate with people. Right, yeah. and not only let them connect with the product, but also kind of um, feel, have them feel inspired to think differently, eat differently, drink differently, exercise differently. Um, so Could it's a we, consciousness. Let's end with um, three business tips. You've you've now gone twenty years doing this, yes. right? Um, three business tips for somebody that's just getting off the couch, trying to get their life going. Do it, okay. do it authentically, yeah. obviously, right? Well, no, I would say first of all, dream big. Don't let your dreams ever be suppressed or stifled by what people say you can't do, what people say you shouldn't do, or what you should do. So just dream big and let the sky be the limit. Um, The other thing is surround yourself with smart people, people who are like-minded, kindred spirits, and people who are smarter than you, because it's important to know what you don't know. Sure. And the third thing is to find fulfillment in the little things, the journey the creation, the kind of artistic endeavor. It can't be the finances. It can't be the bottom line. It can't be the fame. It can't be the reputation of, you know, being the best or being number one because that will always skew your perspective and the decisions that you make. And in many ways, it could sabotage what you do. So um, we've interviewed Richard Branson. We've interviewed the guy that shot Bin Laden, the CEO of Kodak, and those guys all went to college. Did you finish college? Because you're a pretty smart guy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I didn't finish college. Actually, when I started... Where did you my... get all this knowledge? From the kombucha. <laughs> From the kombucha, yeah. It's a very wise <laughs> culture that you know has taught me a lot. Um, well, first of all, I, I think I'm a... Um, I pride myself on wanting to know everything, right? So regardless of what interaction I'm in, I really want to take in that other person's perspective, their experience, their background. And I, um, I, I pride myself on being a fast learner because I think... I mean, knowledge is key, right? Um, and I think that I was, I, I, I feel very blessed to come from the kind of Eastern 
um, experiences that I was exposed to at an early age, which kind of... It opened your mind up. It forces you, yeah, to have a very open mind, to be a sponge that there is no wrong. There's beauty in everything. Yeah. Um, and so I, I see the world through that, through, through that, through that perspective, lens. and it helps. You're awesome. Here's what Mark Webb, Johnny Waite, Suffer the Seed Huntress, and Curl Nye took away from that interview with GT Dave. It's just interesting that there's all these beautiful, yummy, really healthy things that are out there that are estranged until someone gets really dedicated. Yeah, and it's great how he got into that too. So he, he didn't yeah. look for, you know, I'm going to look for the next new health fad. He no, saw it, it something, touched his family. Yeah, he saw something that worked for his family and just kept playing with that idea. He's, he is a bit different. Um, than some of the others we've seen in that he's, he's similar in that he's a self-made man, right? Very I mean, much he, so. He, very much so because he's a guy who dropped out, well, dropped out of high school or quit yep. the normal high school track yep. and went a different direction and then went into college but quit that as well mm -hmm. to take on this company. So he already kind of had that vision and he had the self-drive, if you will, to go ahead because of the family situation yep. to get into this. But, you know, from looking at him and talking to him, you get, as you say, this almost spiritual kind of guy, yeah. very quiet, unassuming. Yeah. You know, you, you wouldn't think that that was a guy who had, you know, probably, what, 16, yeah, 17, is already kind of being a rebel, yeah. right? Because he doesn't want to follow the normal path. Yeah. He's going he's gonna to chart his own. But I also thought it was great that he said, I never was chasing uh, profit. I was never chasing um, fame or fortune. What I was chasing was an opportunity to contribute and, and give something that I really knew a lot about and wanted to master. And, um, and when he said, you know, at the end of the, the tips, he said, don't get too caught up on that big picture at the end and that that's the only thing you're going after. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the art along the way. Well, and we've heard that again and again from different people. I think back to, you know, the wrestlers you're going to read who say, if you want to be a national champion, don't worry about being a national champion. Worry about being the best at the basics. Yeah, but I'm interested. You used two words. You used uh, picture. Yeah. And you use the word art, and it kind of makes me think the same thing of the artist, right? Yeah. The struggling artist that's out there painting and striving to create their vision. Yeah. They don't really care if you like it. That's right. You know, they're, they're painting what they see yeah. and what brings them pleasure, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and that's what they're trying to achieve, some kind of perfection in their mind what it should look like. Yeah. So I think, yeah, with, uh, with GT Dave too, there's one point where I think his success was assured. So he's probably, what, 13, 14, 15 when he decides to drop out of school. Yeah. I think uh, we need a new term. He liberated himself from liberated. the, well, yeah, the so, confined uh, cages of So we, I, I've, I've seen in these podcasts again and again uh, talking about delayed gratification yeah. and, and making hard decisions now to get a reward later. And he recognized that his path was not sending him in the right direction. And mm. at that age, that's phenomenal. Yeah. And so that right there is kind of the spark that, that shows that he would have been successful in whatever because he recognized that you know, he needs to make that, that change to make yeah. himself better and push himself in the right well, direction. Well, he's a guy who can rely on himself. Yeah, yeah, Again, exactly, which yeah. kind of goes yeah. to the whole endurance athlete or the wrestling yeah. mindset. He's, he's not worried about what everybody else is doing. Right. Right. He's worried about what he's doing. Yeah. Well, he and, said and he's uh, got the intestinal fortitude to keep yeah. moving forward. And when they said um, or when Joe said, well, what if yeah. the kid next door starts doing it? You know, you're taking your time. What if the kid next door starts? doing it? He goes, I don't care about the kid next door. I'm just going <laughs> to do it really well. The last thing I want to mention um, was that the parental support, you know, we think about parental support and we tend to get all down and think that means doing things for our kids. I love the fact that when he said to his dad, hey, I really want to go with this and turn this into his business. His dad said, yeah, that's a big thing. I guess you'd better do that. Thanks for listening to this episode of Spartan Endurance on Spartan Up Podcast. Come back every Tuesday to hear new interviews with Joe DeSena, the founder and CEO of Spartan. And stay with us the rest of the week for classics, for DECA, and endurance episodes. If you want to see more classic episodes, go to spartan.com slash tough bible. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Honey Stinger and Climber Honey Stinger. Made with organic honey and delicious ingredients. Use the code HSSPARTAN2020 at HoneyStinger.com to save 30% off. Climber, the most effective cardio and strength machine. Climber provides a full body strength and cardio workout with zero impact in only 30 minutes. Go to Climber.com, that's C-L-M-B-R.com, and use the code SPARTAN. SPARTAN.